All right, uh, welcome to our evening class. I don't know whether to call it afternoon or evening class. I'm trusting that group B is around. Yeah, maybe somebody can confirm for me if group B is around. This is a class that uh, our session was cut short last week. And uh, if they are around, I'm just checking something here, sorry for that. Good, good, good. Just confirming some audio using my phone. Now, I wanted to confirm whether group me members are in. They have logged in so that we can just do a brief uh, recap of what you covered last week. Otherwise, if they are not around, then uh, it doesn't make any sense. It's a moot point. Okay, so let me get a few confirmation from group B uh, members. Let me get a confirmation whether you are in group B so that I know where we need to start from. All right. Okay. Just a few housekeeping rules. If you have any query or question or comment, you can raise it in the chat section. Also, towards the end of the session, I'm going to share a live link here on uh, Zoom so that you can ask a question. If you feel there is a question that that uh, you can't be able to express it adequately in the chat area, I always share uh, the link to Zoom so that you can ask live. But only if your question cannot be expressed uh, in a written form. But remember, exams are in written form, they are not oral. So I and I believe that you should be able to express yourself uh, in written format. All right, as I wait for that confirmation, last week we had a session with group A and C. And uh, for group B, we didn't have it. It was a starting session. And then also, let me first make this full screen so that you can see me clearly. So when I make it full screen, know that I'm not seeing much of what is happening on your side, but I am uh, monitoring on the on my phone as well. Now, um, just for the sake of, uh, because we are not going to repeat this topic again, uh, for the sake of completeness and uh, you know to put it aside, I'm just going to do uh, an overview of what we covered last week. Then we continue with the new materials for today. So so far, I believe that there's nobody with any question that you have some uh, basic understanding of what cement is, whether in theory or in practice. Because in practice, because our constructions most of them are done using concrete and in concrete we use cement so we understand the significance why cement is very important and we said for purposes of understanding first we defined that uh, cement is that material that has these characteristics adhesive and cohesive properties and you know from your physics an adhesive material is one that uh, able to bore to different particles while cohesive is within itself. That's the general definition of what cement is. But to understand uh, in construction, we restrict ourselves so that we do not now, because you know even glue, glue itself have got these adhesive and cohesive properties. So to restrain ourselves, we are concerned with those materials, those boarding materials that are used with construction, uh, either stone, sand, bricks, buildings, etc., uh, building stones, etc. And we said from our previous lecture that generally the cement that we are talking of, the main constituents are lime. Okay, lime. When you see lime, you're talking of calcium. There is calcium inside there. Whether it's quick lime, calcium oxide. Whether it's lake lime, calcium hydroxide. Okay. So when you see lime, think of uh, calcium being the main component. So basically in our building and civil engineering construction, we are talking of calcareous cements, cements that have got calcium in them. Remember, this is just to narrow down what is it that we are focusing in because, or focusing on because we have now emerging cements which do not, they are not calcareous in nature, okay? To, so to further confine ourselves, we set on hydraulic cements. And these are cement that they need, they set and harden under water. So they need water for them to set or harden. Okay. You see somebody here making a floor. 
using this is maybe motor because I, when I look closely, I can't see aggregate, okay? So this setting and hardening, we said it's a chemical reaction. It's not a physical reaction and it's a chemical irreversible reaction as we are going to see, okay? So when cement hardens, that hardens mass lump, you cannot say that you pour water on it and then you remix to recover your cement. Once cement comes into contact with water after a while, when it sets and hardens, then that's done. It's a chemical irreversible reaction. So basically, this hydraulic cement consists of aluminates and silicates. Remember, they have calcium in them. So you're talking of calcium, silicates, and calcium aluminates. And we can further classify this hydraulic cement, this cement that uh, hardened at the water, we can further classify them in a, we can further classify them as natural cement, as you're going to see the definition. Natural cement is just a combination of limestone and clay. Okay, limestone, remember this brings about the calcium. Then the clay, this is where we are going to get the aluminums and the iron. Then there are portular cement, we're going to see that definition, and high alumina cement. Even without getting the definition, you can get from this word high alumina that the aluminum content or the alumina, aluminum oxide content is rather high. So for natural cement, you're saying these are cements that are obtained uh, naturally by mixing limestone and clay. So we obtain this by powdering the rock. So this is a mixture of this limestone and clay. You grind and then calcine. Calcine is heating it to high temperature. And in production of cement, we are talking of temperatures above 400, typically 400 degrees centigrade. Okay, so calcination. The limestone, and then you grind. When you hit the very high temperature, there is going to be fusing. Different elements are going to fuse together to become one. And then the resultant, you grind it to produce that cement. Now, further in our definition, look at what you call posanic cement, because it's the one that you're going to be seeing so much. Actually, you'll be seeing two words. And when you get the bags of cement in our labs, you're going to be seeing a PPC and OPC. You'll be hearing of OPC, ordinary portland cement, and portland pozzolanic cement. Okay, so a common one that is coming in is portland, portland. This is ordinary, this has got uh, pozzolanic material. So we need to define what is pozzolanic material. So we are saying that there are some materials or some cement that are, uh, remember the other cement that you're talking of in the natural cement, you're saying we have to heat limestone and clay in very high temperatures and we talked of the word calcining okay calcination sometimes you may hear the word sintering okay very high temperatures but there are cement that you can produce by simply grinding natural materials at normal temperatures okay technical definition of this word for pozzolana it is a siliceous siliceous is silica silica oxides it contains silica and alumina. Naturally, they possess very little or no cementitious values. And you remember what is cementitious value? It have got adhesive and cohesive properties. So these, in their naturally occurring form, they contain very low, little or no cementitious value. But if we grind them to very fine form, finely divided form, so we grind them to very fine powder. Now, when you do that, in the presence of moisture, they can chemically react with calcium hydroxide at ordinary temperatures to form compounds possessing cementitious properties. So what is the difference between this pozzolanic cement and non pozzolanic cement? So you're saying pozzolans, when you are producing them, we do not need to calcine them. You do not need to heat to those uh, sintering temperatures, very high temperatures, but you just need to grind them to very high form or very fine powder, okay? Finely divided form. So that now, when they come into contact in moisture at only temperatures, they can be able to produce those compounds that possess cementitious properties. Then we said pozzolan, pozzolanic, the word P, the letter P, pozzolanic, and then we said the potlard. So we'll be hearing potlard cement, which is a very common cement that we use in our country. So potlard cement are obtained by mixing calcareous, intimately, of course, you know the word intimate, so you are mixing them thoroughly. You mix uh, this calcium containing 
and are gracious, this from clay, alumina silica, and iron oxide bearing materials. And then you burn them at high temperatures. Then what results you grind. And that's why you find like, we have pot lard in ordinary potra cement. But here in the pozzolanic cement, we are not leaving it just as pozzolanic cement because you know in pozzolanic cement, we are not heating them to high temperatures. And we're going to see the reason for these two or what is the difference. So when we see the word pot lard, it means now heating in high temperatures, crinkling temperatures coming in. So in this case, we are saying for pot lard pozzolanic cement, it's like a hybrid of pot lard cement with the pozzolanic material, while ordinary pot lard cement doesn't have pozzolanic materials. Okay. So here now we also give an outline of how we produce or we manufacture cement. We said the raw materials for cement is limestone. So limestone and clay. So from limestone, that's where we get calcium. Because it comes with calcium oxide. When it comes to water, it becomes calcium hydroxide. So calcium oxide is called quick lime and calcium hydroxide is slick lime. So from clay or shell, now this is we obtain uh, the silica, the alumina and the oxide. The silicon, on, the silicon oxide, aluminum oxides and, and uh, uh, iron, okay? So that's why you find like, if you go to like, let's say Ad River mining, you're going to see quarries. So quarries, they are mining these things. They, of course, you, as a materials engineer, they go there, they assess the, an area, they see that there is abundance of limestone, maybe another area they can be able to obtain clay shell, which are contain these components. Silicon, or silicon dioxide, aluminum, we call them silica, alumina, okay, and iron. So they are mixed together through quarrying. Uh, through quarrying process, we obtain, we extract. Then they are crushed, crushed and mixed together, and then you grind them. Then they are taken to a kiln. This is now heating to very high temperatures. So this is where crinkling occur. Crinkling temperatures. Another word is sintering. Okay, very high temperatures, about 14, 50 degrees centigrade. And they are heated. So in a kiln, of course, we know what is a kiln. We have learned, I think, over time we have come to learn what a kiln is. It's just an enclosure. Usually the walls are made that they can be able to uh, prevent loss of heat. Usually it will be made of ceramic material. Then in here, we heat to very high temperatures, such that the materials even melt. Melting, why the purpose of this high temperature? Fusing occurs. So these independent materials, calcium, the independent elements, calcium and silicates, okay? Calcium and silicate, they are going to fuse together at this very high temperature to become one compound, okay? So that we end up having calcium silicates, okay? Calcium silicates. Now, what will end up when you grind now from the kiln, you are going to end up this uh, fused materials, calcium silicates, what we call a crinker. So this crinker, you grind it, it will come out as small pellets, black pellets. And sometimes this crinker is if like we, let's say the rules of uh, NEMA, National Environment Management Authority, if they become too tough sometimes, or if we have depleted, maybe a company, a river mining, Baboli, they have depleted uh, where they are, they are quarries. Eh? Sometimes we import this crinker from South Africa. So it will come in black form. There are black pellets, small pellets, eh? granular, maybe up to a maximum of 25 millimeters. So these are ground now. You grind them and the gypsum is added. And you're going to see the rope, the purpose of gypsum. So this is added in the grinding process. And what we add up is now what we call the pot lard cement. So in a nutshell, this is the production of cement. And this is uh, pot lard. Remember, it's pot lard cement. So this is in summary form. Of course, in either of the process, there are details, okay? In either of these steps, there are details. We are going to see some of them. Uh, we might jump some of them because uh, some are not maybe too much important for this course. But one of the most important thing is the, the mixing. You know, you have quarried materials from different sources, eh? the clay and the limestone. You have quarried them from different sources. You have crushed them. So the mixing part, you can mix them either in wet or in dry condition. And this is what I'm explaining here, the mixing part. So we are saying clay is here, 
and then chalk. So when you see uh, uh, chalk, we are talking of limestone. Eh? I hope you know that. There are so many names. Calcium carbonate is chalk. So chalk, there's carbon coming, I mean, calcium coming in. So chalk and clay, they are brought in uh, and then water is added. Now, this is, if you want to mix them in the wet process, we are adding water. So clay, we add water in a wash mill. So they are mixed together to get a slurry. You know, like clay, when clay, you mix it with water, you are get, going to get a slurry. That's that thick, viscous substance. And then the next step, we have chalk or limestone and water in a, mix, in a wash mill, they are mixed together. And then all this flows to this bleeding chamber. And then they form now one slurry, okay? So at this stage, eh, at this stage, the clay and the chalk are in one mix. And that's why they are stored here in this slurry tank. But they are still independent. They have not fused together to become one. So if we are talking of calcium, we have calcium, we have uh, in the clay, we maybe have silica, we have alumina, we have iron. They are still separate elements. So this one now are fed into a kiln. This is a kiln and we are saying it's rotating. So rotary kiln. And as you can see, this is a break, breaking line. Eh? Now you have learned AutoCAD. This is a broken line. So it says that we continue here. Okay. So this kiln is inclined at an angle, so at a certain percent. So you can see it's inclined so that this slurry can be able to flow slowly downwards. So what happens from the bottom or from the lower side of the kiln, a hot blast of air is being blown, very hot. And uh, of course, here we are showing where it's coming from. That's why you see in production of cement, there is a lot of production of carbon dioxide. You see we are using coal, eh? coal, and then uh, hot air, then we are heating. So as the hot air comes up, so as the hot air comes up, it means the slurry, it meets the slurry that is flowing downstream. So what happens? Hot air, hot air contains oxygen, of course. There is oxidation will occur. And again, oxidation will occur, and that's why carbon, some part of carbon combined with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, and then it will be released. So you see, we are producing carbon from here and carbon when we, of course, when coal is heated combined with air, there's carbon dioxide that is being released. So that's why production of cement is uh, not normally is harmful to the, to, the, to the environment. Of course, uh, there have been modifications trying to see how we can, uh, you know, direct this uh, effluent eh, air, carbon uh, dioxide to maybe it's taken to some place which it can be recycled to produce something else. But anyway, our concern is there. So when it flows downstream, when uh, the, this mixer is flowing downstream, there are things that happen. The temperatures along the kilns are different, okay? The temperatures here, of course you expect where hot air is starting here towards the bottom or the end of the kiln, the temperatures are very high. But as the air, of course, is escaping on this side, of course here the temperatures are not very high. And that's why we are saying, so as, as, as uh, the slurry flows, what start off here, of course, you see it contains water, of course, uh, water and of course, all these mixtures. Eh? So moisture evaporates when the temperatures, of course, around from 100 degrees centigrade, the water will evaporate at this stage. So if you can subdivide maybe your kiln into a part, eh? you can say the uppermost part, that's where now we lose, uh, we lose uh, moisture. Okay, so as the slurry moves down, so the water moisture is driven off and carbon dioxide will be liberated. Okay, then uh, as it moves down, it becomes uh, dry. So at the, di at the hottest part near the bottom here, the material is liquid. Now the elements have melted and lime, which is calcium oxide, silica and alumina combine. So at this part is where fusing occurs. Calcium, and alumina and uh, what else? Silica, which is silicon dioxide, this combines. And this is our sole purpose why we are taking our material to this kiln so that we end up having a different chemical, I mean, element. They are not separate now, but they have formed a compound. And now what comes out here are those small balls I said they are clinker and they are taken to a cooler. So now this clinker, 
They are taken to a ball mill. Remember the clinkers have got uh, sizes of between three to 25 millimeters. Uh, millimeters. They are taken to a ball mill for crushing. And this is where now gypsum is added. Gypsum is calcium sulfate, of course, hydrated calcium sulfate. So it's mixed here. And then the powder that result is the cement. Okay. Now here we are showing the packages of cement. Now these are just processes. Whether it's carried, it's packaged in bags or it can be carried in bulk transportation, yeah, in hoppers and so on and so forth. So this is the the wet process. So you see the wet process, materials, which are maybe why why we opt for this wet process is if the materials have got high high percentage of moisture. Maybe the clay that is being mined have got high water content, high moisture content, or the chalk from the quarry high water content. So we opt to just mix the water with water here at this stage. But the dry process, if the materials are so hard, you see if they are so hard, it means even by mixing here, like we are mixing, mixing clay and water, they will not come out as a clay slurry. So if the materials are very hard, okay, that, that, that is, they do not disintegrate in water. Or for example, in very cold countries where freezing and freezing is a big issue or where we have shortage of water because we are not talking of, uh, 10 liters or 20 liters, you are talking of a uh, thousand of gallons. Yeah, you know, it's a big factory. If you have shortage of water, then we may opt to go for the dry process. So, the dry process, the process is the same. I don't want to talk much about it because from this second part, everything continues the same. If, if you look at this second part and you look at uh, the previous slide, they are the same. But in this, um, uh, the dry process, you see there is no water being added here. So limestone is crushed. The clay, limestone now, which brings the calcium, and this, the, the shell or the clay, which brings the alumina, the silica, the iron, is, they are mixed together. They are crushed, crushed, then the powder will be mixed together. The, of course, they are reduced to small form, not to powder form. That's why we take to ball mill, so that now here will be ground to very fine powder. And then they are taken to this breading. To end up having low syrup. Okay. Now that material will be fed. This is still the mixing that is occurring, and then it will fed to a rotary kin. I don't know what to explain too much about here, but I just wanted to say that here you see that you are avoiding the, uh, the, the, the water. Of course, now crushing, when the if materials can readily be sold for disintegrating water, it means you are reducing the power that is required for crushing. Now, something that I should mention is that when we have ended up having either these materials together and they are separate, like the way we had in our previous slide, we had uh, slurry here. This ingredient are in different composition. So before we heat them so that they can fuse, we sample, okay? There is quality control that is done. So samples are taken and to measure the different composition of either of these. And if one is in minimal quantity, then they might be adjusted accordingly. So in a similar manner, the raw syro that we get here, we sample and then we check to see the composition. Depending on the type of cement that we want to produce, then we can adjust the composition. Okay. And then after that, after the mixing, then everything will come. Of course, there are some different steps here. There are different uh, uh, things that are happening here compared to the previous slide, uh, previous. Uh, method the wet process but after that from this process going on everything continues the same okay so remember we said that when we are grinding the clinker we have obtained the clinker in this step when you are grinding here we add gypsum so why do we add gypsum calcium sulfate okay the purpose of calcium sulfate or gypsum is to, to reduce or to control what is called flash setting. So that is something that you should take into consideration, flash setting. We are going to define what is flash setting. And it's something that is undesirable. It's an undesirable property in cement that you should try to avoid as much as possible. Flash setting. That is the purpose of, of including gypsum in your manufacture of Fortran cement process. So, so the clinker we are saying is a characteristic black hard and it integrated with calcium sulfate, which is gypsum in order to prevent flash setting and also to facilitate the grinding process. So it means as well as 
uh, reducing flash setting rate around when cement coming in contact with water, it's also helping in the grinding process. Now, I'm looking at, uh, at uh, the chart there, just to remind you that make sure you, you register your attendance. You have to register your attendance by writing your name or register number in the chat area. And you also need to make sure that you, if you have any query, you can ask in the chat section. As we continue, I can uh, answer them as we go by. Now, so what is happening eh, in the manufacture, the chemical composition in the manufacture of cement, there are those chemicals, so this, those minerals that come together, okay? Now, we talked of, this is something that should always be in your mind that we are talking of calcium, okay? And uh, or limestone and the silicate and aluminum. So this, and iron sometimes. So these are from clay or shell, and this is from limestone. So the, comp the chemical composition of the cement that result is that note that calcium, you see, calcium, which in this class, uh, in this class, and this for this course we represent as C. This is the beauty, the beauty of uh, engineers, applied scientists. Eh? We do not have to write uh, the full chemical compound or the chemical composition. Okay. If there's somebody from your class trying to call in, please guide the chat because I can't be able to pick your call. No? I would also like to get a confirmation so that I'm not by myself here. Okay. Yeah, but as long as I can hear myself in the video, it means I'm okay. Okay. All right. Now, so we are saying in this step, in this last step here, okay, here, All right. that now. there is fusing at 1450 degrees centigrade, yes. sintering, okay. Crinker, they fuse. So the calcium from clay, the silica, the alumina, they combine. That's what we are seeing now the composition, the calcium and silicate combine, and calcium and aluminate combine. And they combine this form tricalcium silicate, of course, this is now chemistry, three parts of calcium silicate or three atom, whatever it is, and one of silica. And then the other compound is formed is dicalcium silicate. Tricalcium aluminate and tri tetracalcium alumino ferrite. So you can see aluminium and ferrite. Ferrite is iron, eh? iron oxide. So you see compounds or elements from clay, aluminium, and iron are combining with elements from limestone, calcium, 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 calcium. Okay. So calcium is a very big composition of cement. Now the composition, the composition as as follows. You see, tricalcium silicate have got the high composition, followed by dicalcium silicate, tricalcium aluminate, and tetracalcium aluminoferrite being the least. So if you add the total of this, you are going to get it to ninety five percent. So the five percent is gypsum, hydrated calcium sulfate, to make it to hundred percent. So either of these, and I need to mention here that there is a, a general English name for either of these compound, the tricalcium silicate, referred to as arite, the tricalcium silicate, barite, the tricalcium aluminate, alum, uh, it's called aluminate, and of course ferrite is the tricalcium alumino ferrite. Okay. Now, either of these have got a contribution to the properties of cement. And as you can see, we are saying that tricalcium circuit contribute to the mode of the strength. I remember it had 50% because this one explains the, the reason why, okay? We needed to in high composition. Mm. Okay. 
Now, okay, sorry for that. Now, <clears throat> so this uh, tricasium uh, silicate is responsible for R strength, especially during the first 28 days. Okay, the first 28 days, it's responsible for R strength. And you're going to see how strength develops. It's not just by, by becoming hard, you know, it's chemical reaction that happens when these compounds come into contact with water. Hydration occur. So the second compound, which is uh, belite, it hydrates slowly, very slow. And therefore, this is responsible for strength gain maybe after four weeks, after 28 days. These two contributes in significant countries to strength. In fact, the fourth, the fourth compound is not known to play any role in strength development, but they have all got, of course, other, other roles that they are playing. The other thing is that Trichasium aluminate, it's highly exothermic. So when it comes to contact with water, it releases a lot of heat. And this may lead to our cement paste hardening very quickly. Remember, you want cement paste, or you want a material that you can be able to take and uh, have time to transport it to where you want to go place it, if you are going to cast a, a floor or a slab or a beam. So you want to have ample time. So you don't want a, a cement, at immediately you mix your cement with water, it hardens. But if this equation or if this reaction is allowed to proceed without control, because of the very high heat that is generated, it's going to result to very high, uh, a quick hardening of our cement, which we call flash setting. Our cement paste or our concrete will, st will stiffen very fast. And this is not a desirable characteristic because we will not have adequate time to place and vibrate our concrete, compact it, okay? Therefore, we need to control this reaction by bringing in gypsum. So that's why gypsum is added during manufacture of cement. And something maybe I should mention here is that there are two things that you're going to see. Of course, in some books, they are used interchangeably. There is the one that you get called additive and another one called admixture okay additives they are added during during cement production okay they are added during cement production but admixtures they are added during concrete production so take note, note of that that additives we can add something to change or to alter the properties of cement so during the production of cement we can add it but when we have our cement we mix it with um aggregates okay and we said aggregates these are fine aggregates and coarse aggregates fine aggregates what you refer to as sand coarse aggregate what you call maybe ballast but we said those are just common common terms okay layman's terms in engineering we talk of fine aggregates and coarse aggregates so when you mix coarse aggregate fine aggregate cement and water to make concrete uh you don't want you don't want you might want to alter the properties of that concrete maybe maybe make it more workable maybe increase the strength so anything you add during production of concrete we call it a mixture okay so of course the other two you see you can see down here you are saying they do not contribute much to the strength development yeah but at least this one delays the hydration process so let's see some properties of cement because for us to understand the cement that we are going to use in our concrete, we need to understand how it behaves. And one of the very most and the important properties of cement is hydration. Because we said the gaining of strength of cement is not a physical reaction, it's a chemical reaction. And what happens? It's when this chemical composition of cement come into contact with water, they are hydrated, all a hydrolysis process. Hydrolysis, of course, hydro means water. So when they come into contact with water, when they come into contact with water, when they come into contact with water, we start with, remember we have tricasium silicate, dicasium silicate, uh, tricasium aluminate, and tetracasium alumino ferrite. All of these are going to react differently. So 
tricalcium silicate reacts with water to form calcium silicate hydrate. So they are becoming hydrated. Of course, they release calcium hydroxide, slick lime, and heat. So you see, it's an exothermic reaction. So dicalcium silicate, sorry, dicalcium silicate, when it comes into contact with water, again, it becomes hydrated. So hydration process, hydrolysis. So it becomes calcium silicate hydrate plus calcium hydroxide plus heat. Now, calcium aluminohydrates. Okay, so the first ones that we are talking of this will form calcium silicate hydrate. You see this calcium silicate hydrate, calcium silicate hydrate. When calcium silicate either die or try calcium silicate come into contact with water, they are hydrated to become calcium silicate hydrates. So the similar manner when calcium aluminates come into contact with water, they are going to form what we are calling calcium aluminohydrate. Now, as I stated earlier, is that tricalcium aluminate react very violently, which will lead to immediate stiffening, which we call the flash setting. Okay, and we say this is an undesirable characteristic because we will not have time to uh, transport. Whether you are casting your concrete on site, you see where you are preparing your concrete is the distance to where you are going to place it. Maybe you are preparing your concrete on ground floor, and you are casting a slab in fifth floor. So you need time to transport all that, whether you are using a hoist, a crane to hoist your concrete. You need time to transport your concrete. So gypsum comes in to act as an intermediary by delaying this reaction. So what happens is that gypsum, instead of tricalcium aluminate reacting, gypsum will react with the aluminate to form calcium sulfur aluminate. So instead of the hydrate, you see it could just have come into contact with water, Calcium aluminate, tricalcium aluminate with water to form tricalcium, okay, to form uh, calcium aluminate hydrates. But instead of that happening because that will lead to flash stiffening, uh, flash setting, an intermediary substance is formed, calcium sulfur aluminate. And this is going to coat the tricalcium aluminate particles. Remember, in a cement, we are talking of, let's use this a container. And this is our cement. Can I get a confirmation maybe from the cluster? Because I'm seeing the number of people who have registered their attendance is very low. Are we having any problem, Crassrep? Crassrep, or any, any, any of the people who are in there? Michael Anjara, any problem? Because I expected that now since we are 70 of us, I expect to see uh, the number of those who are in the meeting, the registration to be around 70 or thereabout. Yeah, let me know. Let me know whether you have any problem typing in the chat area. I can even try from this side. Okay. So don't forget. To register your attendance. Eh? Okay. So I just typed it there. If you can read what I've typed, it means we are together so far. So let other people who have not registered their attendance to do so before we close the meeting. Eh? Now. I know for group A and C, they might see that this is a, I mean, a repetition, but for purposes of group B members, it's very important that we summarize this, okay? Because once we move out of cement, we are not going to come back to it again. And, and the other thing is that, as I told you in class, is that you are not going to be taught anywhere else about cement. And this is one of the materials that you are going to encounter so many times in your lifetime as you practice. So I feel like uh, this class, you could put it, you could put more, more weight onto it, into it, more weight, All right? Okay. So again, I would also like to confirm, is my audio okay? Whether my audio is okay, please, let's confirm there. Okay. 
اوكي All right, we continue. We'll continue for the sake of time. Now I move a little bit quickly. Yeah. Now, once we say in this container, when you add water, remember all these four compounds, they are not in isolation. They are in one mix. It's just a, you know, let's say you take a sample of cement. They are in one mix. So they are inside here. So all of them are reacting at the same time, depending on their the activity you know sequence eh? it's not that the equation that you are writing will occur separately so if this reaction was to occur very occur very fast eh? yeah if this reaction was to occur very fast and uh and it forms or our paste hardens quickly then we might not be able to get the strength that's required and remember we say tricassium aluminate is not responsible or for, for, for strength, for much of the strength, okay? So what happens in this case is that to delay this material from reacting fast, we are going to, or the gypsum comes in place, it coats the particles so that tricalcium aluminate are covered by this insoluble sulfur, calcium sulfur aluminate, okay? This gives enough time for tricalcium silicate which is the one that gives much of the strength. It gives this time to react now and the release of course or gain strength leading to natural setting. But of course, eventually we are saying the tricalcium aluminate hydrate will be formed. Although we are saying it will be preceded by uh, another uh, slightly unstable compound produced at the expense of the originally high sulfate calcium Sulfur aluminate. So don't be so much confused about all this chemistry. For you, purpose of your understanding is to know that we have delayed the reaction or the hydration of tricassium aluminate so that we can give time tricassium, tricassium silicate to react slowly, okay, uh, and also to avoid the flash setting. So the last aluminate is tricassium aluminoferrite, which reacts or hydrate to form calcium sulfoaminate and calcium sulfoferrite. So this, uh, we are saying this material works as a flux material and it accelerates the hydration of silicate. I don't know whether I have enough time to explain what a, a, a flux a material is for your understanding, okay? But I believe you can, you can check that, you can check that very quickly. What, what I wanted to, to summarize, is are uh, these equations, okay? This equation, it, in our, for engineering, we are not, uh, it's not a problem to not uh, write in full the reaction. So we are saying tricassium silicate, when it comes into contact with water, it hydrate to form calcium silicate hydrate, okay? Plus calcium hydroxide, plus heat, okay? Then, uh, dicassium silicate, the same, you react with water to form the same compound. Eh? Then uh, tricassium aluminate, if it was to react with water, it would have formed this compound. But we are saying this reaction is extremely exothermic. So we are trying to inhibit that. Okay. So that tricassium aluminate in the presence of water and gypsum will form a carbonation of calcium sulfur aluminate. Now this material, when it's formed, it coats the particles of tricassium aluminate, giving time the particles of uh, tricassium silicate to react. And of course, finally, so this you know, they're the same reaction. Then finally, Tetracassium aluminoferrite reacting with water to form, of course, uh, calcium sulfur aluminate. Eh? Plus. So you can write your equation this instead of writing them in four. Okay. Now, just to mention about gypsum in detail, hydrated calcium sulfate. So this one, we have seen how it regulates the speed of a chemical reaction in the early stages. 
and prevent local concentration of hydration product. So the amount of gypsum that is needed will depend with the tricalcium aluminate content in cement because the higher the content, the higher gypsum you need to control that reaction. The alkali content in cement and the fineness of cement. Because again, the finer the cement, the higher its reactivity. But you see, if it reacts very fast, then again, heat, a large quantity of heat may be generated, causing flash setting. <laughs> so it's a balance. We want our concrete to gain strength early, but then we do not want, again, to be too quick reaction, such that there is a lot of heat that is generated, because it will cause our reaction to be incomplete. We have seen that the different element or compounds in cement don't react at the same rate. So if it's now a large amount of heat is generated by just one of the uh, chemical compounds, then it means that the other ingredient will not react and then it's just hardened and you do not have the strength. Okay. So as this happened, we have, of course, this is the rate of hydration from fastest to slowest. We are saying tricalcium aluminate is the one that is very reactive, followed by tricalcium silicate. And that's why we need to slow down this using gypsum so that this one can start. It gives us uh, much of the strength that is required. Then tetracalcium aluminate follows, followed by dicalcium silicate. So this is responsible for strain development, strength development after 28 days. This is responsible for our strength development. So, of course, this rate of hydration uh, decreases with increase in time. Why? Because these materials are reacting in the same environment. Okay, If it's in a container where you are mixing, they are reacting. So the product that are formed, the hydrates that form, calcium silicate hydrate, when they form and precipitate, they cover the other unreacted particles which means that now water to percolate, to penetrate, to reach this unreacted particles takes time. And that's why the rate of hydration will decrease as the accumulation of hydration product around the unhydrated cement grains, which will prevent the water from channeling to them. Of course, again, if it's in this container, once we do our mixing with the amount that we have measured, and we press our concrete, maybe we are casting a beam, okay? That is a cross-section. We have casted our, our, our concrete, so there is no other water that is coming inside there. Of course, we pour water for curing, but inside there, there's little extra water that we can add apart from what is already entrapped there. So this water, it continues reacting in here and it diminishes. So the reduction in the amount of water, either through chemical reaction or some water evaporate. And this is not desirable, but that's why we do curing. We cover or we continue pouring water to replace for what was lost during uh, evaporation. Or, the reduction, of course, these unhydrated grains continue decreasing, okay? They continue reacting. So as this reaction occurs, you have seen for all the four reactions, heat is generated. So the chemical reaction of cement when it's coming to contact with water is exothermic. We need to understand about the, uh, the heat of hydration that is involved, okay? This graph is a summative representation of what is happening, okay? And I would like you to explain it in a very, very simplified way. We start with, this is our container where we are mixing. In our container where we are doing our mixing, okay? Okay, sorry, all right. So where we are doing our mixing, So all the materials is here, okay? And then you have poured water, okay? Water is there. So what happens? So when you pour water inside here, um, you see when the compound come into contact with water, the tricalcium aluminate, So we are saying heat, as you can see, the rate of heat evolved 
is dependent with the time. So it's changing with time, as you can see from the curve. So the first stage we are saying is a hydrolysis of cement compound occurs rapidly. So the hydration occurs rapidly, temperature increases, the amount of heat, then it slows down. So what is happening? What is causing this slowdown? There is something on your notes in page number seven that you need to read that explanation in quite a detailed way. Because we are saying when upon adding water, the tricassium silicate at this stage, tricassium silicate rapidly reacts to these calcium ions, okay, and the hydroxyl ions. It rapidly reacts when it comes into contact with water here. And this releases large quantities of heat that we are getting to this point. And the pH rise is very fast to almost 12. And this will last maybe a few minutes, four minutes, there about. However, this hydration process slows down quickly. Okay, what will cause this to happen? So remember in this, in this mix, the hydration product, the reaction is taking place and the product being formed is still inside here, it's not removed. So this release of calcium ions and dioxyl ion, they are in the mix. And as they continue being released, they are saturated. You end up having calcium hydroxide, okay? So the system becomes saturated and the calcium hydroxide starts to crystallize. The calcium hydroxide here in this mix start to form crystals, okay? So when crystals are forming, remember they are also inhibiting, the system is saturated, and for the unreacted particles, they are being now surrounded by these crystals, calcium hydroxide. So, but when they crystallize, they become heavy. So you see now the reaction, because water needs to penetrate and reach these unhydrated particles. That's why the reaction slows down. Okay, that's why the reaction slows down. And this dormant stage, because we say phase two, this is dormant, it gives us time now to transport our concrete to where we want to press it. I'm still not very comfortable with side. I'm not getting any, any feedback from your end. Any problem, Krasrep? Any of the Krasrep, can he confirm? Is there any problem or any or any one of you? I'm not getting any response. Why are people not registering for attendance? Okay. Let me, let me post briefly. If there is a problem, I don't want to be continuing and then uh, people are not together with me. Can I get a confirmation from either one of you whether you can hear me quite clearly? Because if I'm around by my side, then I just post this, we, we go physical. Right? Yes, I'm the guardian. Ah. What does that mean? I'm also using Chrome. 
Yeah, because the, the response is so low. I'm wondering whether we are together. Yeah, yeah, I'm concerned. <coughs> hmm? You see, if there is any problem, I mean, uh, we need to understand it. Eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. At least I've confirmed. Eh? I've confirmed. I was worried because uh, when people are not responding, then uh, I might be speaking to myself on this side, and that is not uh, the, the goal of, of having this class. Eh? Mm -hmm. It's to explain some issues, because I also know that you can read the notes, but it's to explain issues and to expound on areas that might require clarification. Eh? Okay, we carry on. So I was explaining about this heat of hydration using some notes that I have given area or slide number on page number seven eh, in your notes. And I was saying when the hydration products, uh, calcium hydroxide form, it precipitates. Okay, before it precipitates, the system continues getting saturated. That's how the reaction slows down. Think of it like this way. When this comes in reaction water, Calcium silicate comes in contact with water. All the products being formed are suspended in this mix. Okay, they are suspended in the mix. Sorry, Miniko class. Okay. So. So I was saying, think about that everything is suspended in this mix, okay? So it means when too many of the hydration products are formed, they surround the unreacted particles. Therefore, it takes time for the water to reach those particles for them to hydrate. That's why we have this now, the heat goes down, okay? But upon accumulation, of course, as calcium hydroxide is formed also, Calcium, silicate, hydrates are formed. And what happens? These silicate hydrates, they precipitate. They settle on the bottom. Okay? They settle on the bottom. What does that mean? All the other products that were react, the final product that were formed from the reaction, they fall down. So therefore, although now in our, in our container, if we can take our container like this, in our container, let's say that was where our content have reached. Now we have got a residue here, okay, of the particles that are falling down the silicate hydrate. Eh? But now we have more free and reacted calcium silicates. Therefore, reaction now suits up. And that's why now you see the heat going up, up to a point, of course, where by now setting starts and then it slows down. But I wanted to explain this stage. So we say there are phase one, hydrosis of cement compound occurring quickly. Then phase two, we say that there is dormancy period. We may take up to maybe three hours from the start. You see two hours and then you have 15 minutes, almost going to three hours. So during this period, our concrete is in plastic state. You can still be able to remold it. Eh? We can be able to transport it, to place it where we want to put it without difficulty, vibrate it, okay? Now, this stage now four and five, this is where now our concrete starts to harden. Remember, there are two terms you are mentioning, setting and hardening. Set, harden. Set, it have not yet gained strength. Harden, it has started gaining strength. And once it hardens, it's irreversible reaction, okay? 
So, of course, now stage five here we are saying is about maybe that six hours now our concrete have started gaining strength. And now the actual heat of, of hydration that we obtain is dependent of one, the chemical composition of cement. Remember, the heat that we obtain, the total heat, the total heat summation of all the heat is the heat for the four compound. R is equals to one all the way to four, where one to four are these ingredients, tricassium silicate, tricassium silicate, tricassium aluminate, and uh, tetracassium alumino ferrite. And each of these is generating this, the hydrated compound plus heat. So depending with uh, depending with the, the rate at which heat is at R stage, if we have got high composition of uh, tricassium silicate, tricassium aluminate, which react R, R stages, then it means the heat of hydration will be higher. Okay. Again, if we are mixing our concrete or our cement paste in uh, an area, ambient, ambient is the surrounding temperature. If the temperature is high, then the heat of hydration will be high. The type of cement, as we are going to see the different types of cement, there are those cement that um, they harden quickly. We say rapid hardening. That means they have got maybe high content of uh, tricassium aluminate and tricassium silicate. Okay. So, depending on the type of cement, also the heat of hydration will vary. Okay. Now, again, the fineness of cement. What is, how does fineness have to do with the heat of hydration? You see, if you have got very, very big lamps, of course, this is for illustration purposes, and very fine of the same mass, eh? you see, this one have got higher surface area. The more you grind your, your particles, the higher the surface area for reaction to occur. And if you have got higher surface area, it means, the reaction rate is high and the heat of generated is high. Again, the amount of cement in the mixture. Now, when you are talking of concrete, they are concrete of different strengths. Some will be high, high cement content, others low cement content. And depending with the amount of cement, then the heat may occur. So we move to the second properties, which I believe this is where we reached the other group, if I'm not wrong. Setting of cement. We have been mentioning about setting of cement. So we are saying once cement comes into contact with water, the reaction is hydration or hydrolysis. Okay. Now, you see when hydrolysis is starting, eh, the calcium silicate hydrates that form are chemical. I mean, they are, that's what I'm saying is a, a, an irreversible reaction. But you see, before then, we are seeing calcium ions being formed, hydroxyl ions being formed, precipitating out to calcium hydroxide. You see, all this time, when you have mixed your cement with water, strength development have not started. Irreversible chemical reactions have not started. You need this time for you to be able to mix adequately. You can imagine a scenario where immediately, your cement comes into contact with water, it reacts and hardens. I keep on repeating, you need time to go, to transport it, to place it, to vibrate using a poker vibrator before it can gain strength, okay? So when it starts now to stiffen, we say it starts to reduce its plasticity. So you want to work with cement which is in plastic state when it's still, it's not rigid. So. When it have lost its plasticity, the strength have started developing, we say that setting have occurred. So setting is changed from fluid state to a rigid state. While hardening, don't confuse the two, hardening is the gain of strength of cement paste. So the end of setting is the start of hardening. Now there are four stages in which setting occur. So in the first stage, so stage one, so you take only a few minutes. This takes only a few minutes. And uh, the rate of heat generated is higher. We have explained using our graph previously. So due to the wetting of cement particles, so the beginning of hydrolysis or the reaction of cement compound, after which the rate decreases. So the stage two, we talked of the dormant stage, which is a very important stage. Almost one to four hours, you are sure that your cement will not harden. That's why you find like 
Sometimes on site, you have prepared uh, a mix, uh, but you can be able to place it between one to two hours, three hours, but it's still okay. Okay, you just need maybe to add a little water to, to make it uh, work workable. Maybe, for example, mortar when we are constructing a wall. But maybe after that, the following day, you might not be able to use it. They have lost the strength. Okay, so the third stage, again, we understood the dissolution of the weak layer, calcium hydroxide, when it uh, settles out, precipitate, and the silicate precipitate, the, the calf. So we are talking, we are saying, the four stages still follows the stage that we found in the heat of hydration. Eh? Okay. So the third stage is in this part. Okay. And the fourth stage now here, strength have, hardening have started, strength gain have occurred. So we are saying uh, the third stage, it takes about six hours for cement paste, we started consistency. And at the end of the stage, we have the final setting. Now, something I need to mention at this stage is that we have two, two uh, setting times. We have the initial and the final setting times. So the initial tells you that setting of cement have started. The final, it tells you that now we are done with setting and hardening now is will commence. Therefore, if you have not treated, really, you try to uh, cement or concrete at this stage, then you might start now losing it value. But let's see, how do we define these setting times? We define them by conducting a test. Of course, there are, there are a number of tests that we can do, but I give the one that we follow. For us, um, uh, Kenya, we follow the British standards. Now we are moving to the Euro code. So when you see EN is Euro code, but it's from British standards, 186, it's uh, on uh, this test, the setting time of cement but one thing that you need to understand so what we use is called the uh, richard Tellier's. okay not this one so this is called uh, the vicat apparatus so this is one of the tests one of the first experiments that you're going to do in the lab maybe demonstration or maybe something like that so it means after today's lesson next week you should start utilizing your practicals eh, time so this is a, a an equipment of course you're going to see it more properly in the lab eh? so this is an equipment but to explain in short it's just like there is a needle and this needle can be changed to have this we call a plunger it's a bit bigger this is thinner one millimeter this is 10 millimeters this is these are for different tests as we are going to see but for setting and uh, consistency now for you to determine the setting time of cement, you conduct the setting time on a cement of some consistency. Okay. So again, I introduce a certain time. It's like you want to do a test on cement paste, but it's not just any cement paste. That cement paste, because anybody can prepare a cement paste, but we are saying there is a certain criteria or classification for a cement paste that we need that that we need so that now we can say this is a, a standard sample we can do a test on it so that standard sample we say we require a cement of consistency standard or what we call consistency uh, normal consistency okay and we define this by saying uh the, this the consistency so the mass of water to dry cement required to produce cement paste of a desired consistency. So to measure the consistency of cement, as I said, we use the Vicat apparatus as shown here. Now this apparatus, just to explain, of course, you're going to learn more in the lab, you're saying um, for the consistency, we use this needle. So this head you can replace using, instead of this needle, this is for the setting time we put this, it's called a plunger. So you see, we have got three attachment. We have this small needle for initial setting time. We have this enhanced needle for final setting time. And we have this plunger for consistency, consistency test. But the rest of the equipment remains the same. Now here on bottom, we have a kind of a frustrum. 
You see, let, if I put it in 3D, something like this. Okay, it's hollow. So it's placed on a metallic base plate, and now we place our cement paste inside here. We place our so cement paste is cement in water. So you mix cement with water. Then you place it here. You want to check whether it's it's of normal or standard consistency. So what you are saying is that we lower this. There is an adjustable. There is an adjustable movable rod. This rod is movable. So you can be adjusted to come to rest on the surface of your mortar. Okay, not mortar, but cement paste. Mortar contains sands. So it rests here. So you are saying, then this plunger, we allow it to penetrate. We release it and we allow it to penetrate. So if it goes beyond six millimeters, plus minus one. So you are saying the range of five to seven millimeter. You are releasing it from the top. When it rests on the top surface, you release it. If it goes, if it falls within, of course, uh, just to clarify something, is that here on this part that we are not seeing, of course, we have shown a profile, uh, a cross section. If you look from this direction, there is a gauge you can read here to see the readings. So you can see the penetration. When it's resting on the surface here, you see the zero reading. Then when you release, you release a knob here, and then it moves down. You see the penetration in your uh, cement paste. If it's between five to seven millimeter, we say that the cement paste is of standard consistency. If it's below this, maybe it's penetrated three millimeter, then it's too hard not enough water. So it's, it's not of standard consistency. You need to add more water. If it be, goes beyond, let's say like uh, eight or nine millimeter, then we say still it's not of standard consistency. We may need to add more cement to make it a little bit stiffer. So once you are able to ensure that your cement paste is within this range, that is, is of standard consistency. Now you can take, you can say now I have prepared cement paste, which is good enough. Now I can check the initial and the final setting time. Okay, I believe we are together up to that point. So anything you need clarification, Kaidri, uh, you can raise it there. Now, once we have prepared a cement of standard consistency, then we move ahead to, to change, to modify. For initial setting time, you say we use this small needle here. Yeah? Okay. And for the final setting time, for the final setting time, the needle, because this is the needle, of one millimeter, you can see one millimeter square needle is the same needle here. But now we attach, we attach this part with some edges, sharp edges here, okay? So that the same principle, it will come, it rests, and then you release. You release this removable rod. You see how much it's going to penetrate. The same thing for the setting time. There is a, a 10 millimeter, a five millimeter gap and a five millimeter. So the penetration from here to the end here is 10, uh, I mean, one millimeter. And then it rests on the surface. When you release it for the final setting time, we are saying, let this penetrate, this exposed part of the needle will penetrate, but these sharp edges here just makes a mark on the outside. So if we, we talk on plan, there is a penetration of the needle and the the attachment, we say hold out the metallic attachment. This part just makes a mark. So for the initial setting time, we are saying this needle should penetrate between five plus or minus one millimeter. Remember these values are given, they are empirical, empirical data from past studies. That's why they came up with these values. They know if you can be able to make a cement of this uh, behaving in this manner, then uh, it's good. It's normal, it's standard. It's good for utilization in production of concrete. So for initial setting time, you prepare a cement paste. And then you see when it takes to penetrate up that point. If let's say you release the needle and it goes beyond this, of course you had prepared your cement paste to be standard. So it should not go less than this. If it's good beyond this, then you know your cement have not started setting. If it goes beyond five plus or minus one millimeter. So if it's within this, so between four and six millimeters, then you know the initial set have occurred. You mark the time. 
So what happens is that you have prepared your concrete, I mean, your, your cement paste, and then you are keeping on testing, testing until the initial setting time starts. Then you give it time, like maybe four hours. So this is an experiment that might take a whole day or a whole morning, okay? Because now you need to give it time before we can move to, to test the final setting time. So final setting time, now this can't penetrate. If we release this here and it marks, it penetrates and even the edges here, they dig a mark, circular mark, too much that is visible, we know final setting have not occurred. But if it's able to penetrate just 0 0.5 and then just make a mark using these edges of a hollowed out uh, metallic attachment, then we say final setting time have occurred, right? Well, that's, that's enough for explanation. As I said earlier, this course is well understood in practicals. Eh? So you're going to understand much on this equipment in the practice. So the factors that you affect the setting time, of course, will be the water to cement ratio. As I said, and maybe it's good to mention here, that you have got different classes of concrete. So concrete, you said, is a composite material made of uh, cement, which is a binder, fine aggregate, which is hard, and coarse aggregate. Depending on the strength that we want, we may have concrete of strength 15, C15, C20, class 25, class 30, and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, these two, we say they are non-structural. Okay. They are, not of, they are not considered to be of high strength to be used maybe to make structural elements like slab, beam, and so on. So class 25 and 30, normal concrete. When we go to class 4, Well, sorry for that. Uh, I don't know whether I'm back now. My computer just gave me a a green screen, a blue screen. Hello. I hope I come on, uh, I come up well from your side. Sorry for that. Uh, I don't know whether I'm back. Now. Yes, I've confirmed I'm back. My computer just gave me a. Mm. Good. Well, and uh, seems the PowerPoint is disturbing me. Now, <clears throat> we just finalized on the on the setting time of cement. We see the Vicat apparatus, and um, I don't know whether is that size okay with from your side. If you are using, if you're using your, 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 I mean, your what? If you're using your, your phone, you may need to zoom it to make it full screen, eh? And exit the chat for you to be able to see the word document. Now, uh, so, so we are looking at the factors that will affect setting. And uh, we said one of them will be the water cement ratio. Of course, if there is too much water, and I was explaining something concerned uh, to do with the different classes of concrete that we have. That we have uh, 
not only this anyway, we have class 15, class 20, class 25, class 30. Um, and we say now the mixing is the cement, the, 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 the ratios are, we talk of uh, uh, cement, fine aggregate, coarse aggregate. And actually cement, you'll be hearing the word bida. And I keep on repeating why the word bida is because we can have other materials, cementitious materials that are not necessarily hydraulic cement, like geopolymer. So the ratio is that one part of cement will go with three parts of fine sad and six parts of coarse aggregate. For class 20, we have one part of cement with two parts of fine aggregate and four parts of coarse aggregate. For class 25, you're saying is one part of cement, one part by one part, I mean if one kilogram of cement to, if you are dealing with kilograms, to one and a half kilograms of of, of five, uh, fine aggregate and uh, uh, one, one and a half, two. And then finally class that is one, one, two. So you can see the higher the strength that we want. And these values, the numbers, the numeric no values, the 15, 20, 25, this is the strength at 28 days. And the strength is given as uh, Newton's per millimeter squared. So you are talking of 15 Newton per millimeter squared, or the same. Of course, you know Newton per millimeter squared is this mega pascals. So when you say a concrete of class 30, 30 uh, is at 28 days when we test the compressive strength, it should be able to contain or to give us a value of 30 uh, MPA. Okay. Now, you see, now something that is not shown here is water. We know that in the dry form powder, cement is in powder form. Fine aggregate, coarse aggregate. When you mix them, they are still in dry. They, they are dry. Nothing will happen. A reaction will only occur when cement comes into contact with water. And that's why it was very important to understand the, the hydration process. So water is expressed in terms of water cement ratio. So water is given as a weight of cement. So, and usually, normally you'll find the water cement ratio of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0. I mean, the quantity of water uh, is less than uh, the cement that you use. Of course, sometimes the water may be added to cater for other factors like the absorption of uh, aggregate. We are also we are going to see all those properties of aggregate, which define the water that is required. So when we define the strength of concrete and we give the ratios, we also have to specify the water to cement ratio that is required. Okay. Now. When you come here to the factors, we are mentioning the factors that affect the setting time. And one of them we said is the water cement ratio. So the higher the water cement ratio, if there is too much water, then it means the setting time will increase. Okay. Again, if the temperatures is high, if water evaporates quickly, then the, your cement paste will settle fast. And also the chemical composition. The chemical composition will determine or will, will affect the rate at which the hydration process progresses. We have seen about the, the four different major components. I remember the four major components, the, the silicates and the aluminates. These are the four major components for pot large cement. So when we want to get a cement with some special properties, we may add other things, okay? Now, remember we talked about flash setting. We, we said flash, flash setting is when tricassium uh, aluminate, if it, uh, react quickly, violently, it causes your cement paste to stiffen. It, it stiffens quickly. So this is not desirable. It says for setting. However, for setting, sometimes an abnormal premature stiffening of cement within a few minutes of fixing with water may occur. So the difference between for setting and flash setting is that in flash setting, there is a chemical reaction. There is evolution of heat, large quantities of heat. However, in force setting, we do not have significant amount of heat that is generated. And we can be able to recover our workability or to make our concrete, our cement paste workable by just remixing without adding water. Okay? So what will cause this force setting? Remember we said flash setting will be caused by uh, inadequate amount of gypsum. That was one of the reasons, if you can recall, okay? what will cause the force, uh, I mean the flash setting. That's why we add gypsum to prevent flash 
setting. So for setting, the gypsum may be there, but the gypsum is dehydrated. Remember, gypsum is hydrated calcium sulfate. Okay. So what happens is that the clinker, you know, the clinker is the end product from the production. You know, we have the kiln, rotary kiln. We have this pellet now. 3 to 25 millimeters in size, the clinker. And then we are adding gypsum. So this gypsum is hydrated, need to be hydrated. But if, because the temperature is high when this clinker is exiting the kiln, if we do not give it time to cool down before we add gypsum, we may add this gypsum to clinker and then some amount of water is lost. So our, our gypsum becomes dehydrated. So what happens? When we add that kind of a cement, when we add water, when we are mixing, it's going to take the water that is to be used. Remember the purpose of water, the primary purpose is for hydration process. So if this water now is diminished before the hydration process occur, your cement paste will harden. And this is why we are saying force setting will occur. So you see there's no chemical reaction at avocado. So, and of course we are given the different forms of uh, dehydrated gypsum. It could be partially dehydrated that we have half of the uh, water molecule, or it could be totally unhydrated. So we say an anhydride. If the temperatures in the kiln exceed 190, the gypsum will be totally unhydrated. Okay. So this results in stiffening of the cement paste. Of course, the other thing we are saying is reaction of alkali of cement. Cement, we have silicas, we have sometimes potassium, sodium, calcium, alkalis, eh? the hydroxides. Eh? So this, if our cement is stored badly, it may react with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Okay, It may react with carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere, resulting in uh, formation of carbonates. Okay? And we are giving an example. For example, our cement, if it have calcium, uh, potassium oxide or, or sodium oxide, it may react with carbon dioxide plus to get the carbonate. Okay? And this will precipitate it out from our mix, causing the cement paste to become rigid, setting to occur. So for setting, so we can remix that. So again, uh, cement, because it's a powder and fine powder, it's hygroscopic. So if we put it in a wet atmosphere, the tricassium circuit may, uh, you know, the, the cement may absorb moisture from the atmosphere and this uh, compound may start reacting. So the condition of storing of cement is very important. And now to differentiate, because I already mentioned about it, we said flash setting, there is no gypsum. But in four setting, gypsum is there. Flash setting, there is a chemical reaction that occurs. Tricassium aluminate reacts violent to really large amount of heat. And this will cause rapid setting of cement. And the resultant of this is that you will end up having a porous microstructure. So whatever, I know at this stage we are not talking about microstructure, but what we are saying is that you are going to have like honeycombing in your cement paste with some pores. It's a requirement for you to get good strength or high strength concrete or cement paste, it needs to be dense. Dense substance have got high strength. Uh, I, I mean, uh, ordinarily. So flash setting is not, is something bad more than force setting because flash setting, you cannot, from force setting, you can just remix. Remix your cement paste and then you acquire your, uh, your, your plasticity. But flash setting, if it forms, it's done. And that's why you have to stop that process. Tricassium aluminate reacting fast. You have to slow it down so that it gives time for other compounds to finalize the, uh, the reaction process. Let me move quickly now to the other because I believe I've tackled uh, some of those uh, tests with chemistry. Now we are moving away from chemistry. We move to the other property. I want to do away with the, the properties of cement for now. I've seen a number of people have left, exited. Remember this, this will not be repeated again. Eh? So the last, uh, now the last step in the manufacture of cement, we saw it's grinding of the clinker with gypsum. Okay. So grinding, what is the importance of grinding? Cement need to be fine because the finer it is, the more surface area is exposed for these particles to come into contact with water. And when they come into contact with water, hydration occurs. 
So the rate of, of hydration or the rate of react, I mean, hydration we have understood is the chemical reaction that occurs when cement comes into contact with water and that's how strength is gained in cement. So the rate of strength gain in cement or the rate of hydration is dependent or determined, or is dependent, I mean, it depends on the fineness of cement. So we may need to have a very high, a cement with very high fineness if we want to have cement that we react quickly to develop rapid strength okay so this if the cement paste is high refined uh we may re realize that because of the more extended surface area it reacts quickly and therefore we are able to obtain high area strength of course if the chemical composition is the same at the end of it all when all the ingredients have reacted long-term strength is not affected whether the the particles of the cement were finer or the other were bigger the other are smaller but the one with the fine grains will develop strength I. Okay, we may also want, we want cement to have fine aggregate because you see, concrete is composite in nature. That is we have coarse aggregate, we have fine aggregate and we have cement. So we need cement which is fine enough so that it can be able to cover all these aggregates including the fine aggregate, that is sand. We need our sand to be covered by the cement strata. That's why it have to be smaller sized than the fine aggregate itself. And again, our concrete mix is more workable. We are able to work on it uh, quite well when the, when the cement paste is fine. Of course, it requires more amount of water. However, for us to obtain this high degree of fineness, we need to grind it much more power is required. Okay, the cost goes up. Again, uh, fine cement, when you saw it, it's highly hygroscopic. It is able to attract water, moisture from the atmosphere more quickly than the cement, which is not very fine. And therefore it may deteriorate quickly. Remember, cement does not stay fresh forever. Actually, uh, the manufacturers give you about three months. And if you store your cement badly, then uh, even less than these, these three months, for example, in a damp room. But let's say if you can be able to cover it in a water, in an airtight container, airtight, this cement, because it doesn't come into contact with, uh, I mean, um, water, whether in atmosphere or water, whether in the air or water, physical water, then this cement may, we can say it can rust for a long time. Okay. Again, uh, the other factors or other disadvantages of high fineness, you can check them out here, because I wanted to say that there is a test in the lab that maybe you'll conduct. No, no, no. Currently, we do not have our equipment working, which tests the, the fineness of cement. So the fineness of cement will be given in terms of the service area. Like if we have one kilogram of cement, if you break it down to smaller particles, the service area is increasing. I hope people can understand that that the service area, if you measure the service area around this particle, as you continue breaking them down, it's more than just when you have one big lump. So it tells you that the higher this value, service area per kg, the finer the cement. We use what we call the Blaine's apparatus. Blaine's apparatus in doing this test. This test, I can't assure you that you have it in the, head, in the, in the lab. Now, Cement, you see, when it comes into contact with water, with water, heat is generated. And that heat may cause expansion of your either cement paste or concrete. Of course, we give allowances. But if that expansion is too much, we say that your, your cement is unsound. So that's another property. Because if they expand too much, it may cause cracking of hardened cement paste. So what will cause unsoundness of cement? One of the properties that will cause unsoundness of cement is what we call the delayed or slowed hydration. You see, let's say we have particles as we are saying, and then they are covered by hydration product. Yeah, the hydrated silicate. So that we have unhydrated particles inside. Water takes time to penetrate in here. So that slow rate of hydration means Already the outer part material have hardened and gained strength, but inside there's still reaction. And you see, when this reacts, when water comes into contact with calcium silicate, uh, calcium silicate, eh, 
they expand as they form, as they become hydrated. So this may cause unsoundness of semen. Also the presence of lime, excess lime, magnesium and calcium sulfate. And that one I have explained here, what is happening. If you have too much of lime, okay? If in the raw materials, remember the raw material, one of them is limestone. If raw material fed in a kit contains more lime, that except that the lime that is there is more than what can combine with the other uh, ingredient from clay or shell, there will be some excess lime in your cement. So this excess lime will react when it comes in contact with water, calcium oxide, this quick lime, to become slake lime. And you see, this slake lime have got higher, so it expands, it, have got, it expands more volume than calcium oxide, which may lead to expansion. So that's why we're saying, at either of the stage, although we have shown the flow process or production of cement, at either of the stage, you need to, under, to check. Yeah, there are quality control engineers there, there are labs there, they sample to see what are the ingredients here. Are they in the right proportions? Are they going to combine adequately, okay? So again, the same equation, if more free magnesium or free potassium, uh, calcium, uh, magnesium, they will react to form magnesium hydroxide, okay? Again, if uh, gypsum, is added in excess. We say gypsum is good. Anyway, too much of everything is not good. If gypsum is added in excess, the excess amount will cause expansion because it when it becomes hydrated. Okay. Now to test the soundness of cement, I'm moving a little bit faster here. There's not much chemistry. There's a laboratory test that we do. And there are two tests you can use the, either the American. ASTM refers to as American Society of Testing in Materials, or you can go with the British or Euro code. Eh? For us, again, we follow the Euro code, we use the, the Chetarius test, okay? Uh, this one, of course, you're going to do the test in the lab, but just to explain, to test the soundness of the cement or how it expands, there is this equipment. Yeah, as you can see here, Victoria presentation, there is a slit, it's open on this part. There's a slit here. Yeah, there is, it's open here. So what you do is that uh, you put your cement paste in here. And then of course you put it in an oven, you put it in hot water. What you are going to measure is the separation of these slots, the separation of this slit. Okay. We are going to measure the separation. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that separation will indicate us, will tell us, depending on the standard, the standard gives the specification how much, okay, like BS limits the expansion of that slate 10 millimeters. If it expands too much, then we say that cement is unsound. So this is a very important test that you're going to cover in the lab. Now, the strength of cement is the most important because if the cement have got all the other good properties, it have got good fineness, good soundness, good setting time and all that, but if the strength is not what we, we, we state, then it means it have not met our requirement. Now, something that you should notice is that I have given you the strength of concrete, but I've not given you the strength of cement. So we have cement like the Portland Pozzolanic cement, you'll find being referred to as class that's 2.5. Then uh, ordinary Portland cement, we have class 42. Of course, we have fathers 52.5 and 62.5, but these are the most common uh, cement classes that you get. So don't confuse between the cement of cla class of cement and class of concrete. So this is Portland Pozzolanic cement. This is ordinary Portland cement that we normally use in our labs. And I believe that you are going to use the Portland Pozzolanic cement. It's a bit cheaper than the one used for most construction, ordinary construction around. Usually, OPC, we use it for for structures like bridges, you know, dams, where a rather high strength is required. Now, to get the strength of cement, we create a cube using cement, a cube. It could be of uh, 75 millimeters by 75 millimeters by 75 millimeters. So these modes are standard. When you go, they are called mold, steel mold. So it's a mold made of steel which you can demold and then you put your, uh, your, your cement paste inside here. 
However, sometimes it's very difficult to use neat cement paste, to make neat cement paste. You know, cement paste when you mix in water, it sticks even to the trowel that you're using, even to your hand. So, some, so what happens is that we use what is called a standard sand to make standard mortar. A sand that is of, is of known specific a gravity or properties and so on. So we use standard aggregate or standard sand for us to be able to cast a mortar and then we test the strength of mortar instead of the strength of the neat cement. So we are saying because of that difficulty, there will be a lot of variation. Okay, so we take it to the compression machine you're going to see in the lab. You crush this to see what is the strength, FC, at 28 days. We check the strength. Okay, and there are many tests that we do. The one that I have shown you is what you call the compression test. There is another we call the tensile and fracture. But at this stage, because this one normally we do not do them. Okay, we can do them for cement, but we do them for concrete. We are going to repeat it in concrete. So I'm going to explain further on this test. But for cement, uh, direct compression will be adequate. So we are saying the characteristic strength of cement as specified in this test can have that 2.5 or 2.5 and 52.5. Of course, these are tested at 28 days. I still feel like uh, I don't want to come back to cement again. So I want just to go through, let me see how much of fish is remaining so that if we can be able to summarize. Yeah. So we have defined uh, what is portrait cement area on. We also defined what is natural cement when we are starting. So for to, to, to manufacture different types of cement, what you need is to change the percentage of the raw materials. Okay. If you want more stre higher strength, you increase this composition, you reduce this. So there are cements that are expansive in nature. They expand in high life and then to contract contraction induced by shrinkage or cement that have got high alumina contact. These are important to reduce sulfate attacks. But generally, the types of cement that we have here, as I keep on saying, we have the ordinary Portland cement. We have the rapid hardening Portland cement, low heat Portland cement, surface resisting Portland cement. So this one actually is something like, uh, uh, you, you, you can even read derived from the name. Of course, I explained the, about the ordinary OPC. Rapid hardening, it means it's portal cement that hardens quickly. It's gain strength area. Raw heat is portal cement that uh, emits raw amount of heat. Why is, for example, is low heat? Because each of these cement have got this application. For example, when you are constructing massive dams wall, see a dam, eh, Karimeno dam. You can imagine all this mass of concrete and they are inside here. By the time total hydration, complete hydration happened here, Maybe on the surface, it have hardened. If there is too much heat difference between the inner and the outer, cracking will occur. Therefore, we may need to use low heat cement. Then sulfate resisting. We might be using cement. One of the uh, one of the, uh, the attacks, chemicals that attack cement is our sulfates. Because you see, we have calcium. They can react to form calcium sulfate. Okay. So, when we are constructing maybe in areas like, like marine environment where sulfate salts like sulfates might be there, we may need to use special cement like one which is sulfate resistant. So you can add some additives, as I said, ingredients that are added during the manufacture. You can add some additives to produce cement of different, of different types. But instead of Instead of rushing quickly through this because our time was lost as a result of my misbehaving on my computer, I think we can stop there. I've seen there are some, some more information I have on my note that you do not have. I may need to explain further. So let's conclude it there. We say we meet next time. Uh, we, we start on the types of cement. Now I'm looking at the chart. I see nobody have raised any questions. So I'm assuming that we are all comfortable. Right?
Okay. Uh, I can see the only concern is that uh, a number of you, uh, okay, they were dropped out of the call when, when, after we have started, when I when I had an issue with my laptop, but sorry for that, but I hope uh, other classes, if we may have other online classes, eh, of course, we'll still be having our physical classes once you solve the issue of the rooms. But if we have any other online classes, my attendance is not, this is not good. This is not good at all. Okay. So we stop it at that. Unless if there is question, then uh, just make sure you don't leave before you drop your 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 your, your registration and uh, name, so that I can take record on my side. Then we say we meet next time. Class rep, or I asked together with one another. I still believe in Fendu. We are saying we have challenges with rooms. I still believe you can be able to maneuver around and we get uh, one room because we, I would like to have both uh, online and physical classes as well. There are some issues. Maybe I will tackle physical classes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we stop it at that. Okay. I can see your question. Is how does water proving of concrete occur? Ah, okay. Right now, because we are at the cement level, when we get to concrete, because there are some tests that you need to understand before now, we explain these. Eh? Um, remind me this question, then uh, I'll explain. Okay. All right. Okay. That, that, that's all for now. Let me release you. Because the other part, if I take it, it, will, it might take about an hour or maybe 40 minutes. So see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for your attention coming in.